Hello and welcome to an interview today with Sir Michael Marmot on reducing health inequalities. My name is Jackie White, I'm a director in the System Transformation Group within NHS England and the role of our group is to support the development of integrated care systems. Reducing health inequalities continues to be a priority for the NHS. The five year forward view set out clear action to reduce health inequalities and close the health and wellbeing gap. Vanguards were established across the country to use the opportunity of new ways of working to focus on testing and delivering improvements in health and care. More recently, systems of care have been set up, sustainability and transformation partnerships and latterly integrated care systems, which bring together individual organisations across geographies to focus on improving health outcomes for the local population. This includes a focus on the wider determinants of health. This brings significant opportunities to really embed prevention and health equity at the heart of care models. NHS England commissioned the Institute for Health Equity to review the vanguards and the impact they were having on reducing health inequalities, the lessons they learnt and the transferability of this to these new systems. I'd like to introduce Sir Michael Marmot, who's the Director for the Institute of Health Equity at UCL. Hello. Sir Michael, please can you tell us why you believe health inequalities and a focus on reducing health inequalities is still of vital importance for the NHS. Wherever we look in Britain, we see gaps in health between those living in more advantaged situations and those living in less advantaged situations. For example, I've been a couple of times recently to the Royal Borough of Kensington and Chelsea. Once, I slightly embarrassed to say, to an ambassadorial residence in the posh part of the borough in the south, another time to the area around Grenfell Tower. In the area around Grenfell Tower, men have 14 years shorter life expectancy than men living in the posh part of the borough. So that's in one London local authority. And even more challenging in a way, is not just the difference between rich and poor, but health follows a social gradient. The more deprived the area, the worse the health, the shorter the life expectancy, and crucially, the shorter the healthy life expectancy. So we've got these dramatic inequalities in health right across the social gradient. And then we've got this challenging situation because We've got an NHS that's supposed to be dealing with health and inequalities in health, but most of the inequalities in health are not due to inequalities in access to health care. They're due to inequalities in the conditions in which people are born, grow, live and work and age. In other words, to the social determinants of health. When people get sick, they need access to health care. But it's not lack of health care that leads people to get sick in the first place. So then the big question is, given that people who work in the health care system want to see their role as improving health, what can a health care system do for the health, not just of individuals, but for the health of the local population in which that healthcare system is located. And would you say we've made enough progress over the last 10 years, particularly since your first report was published? Well, if we look nationally at what's happened to health inequalities, my so-called Marmot Review was published in 2010. What we saw was that health inequalities had been getting bigger, then they got smaller, and in the last six or seven years, they've started to get bigger again. So it looked like we were making progress through the noughties, the 2000, 2010, 12, through that 10 or 12 year period. The gap in life expectancy between the poorest 20% of local authorities and the rest, that gap narrowed, but it's been widening again since about 2011, over the last five years that we've got data. It's been widening again. Are there particular cohorts or groups of people that you can identify that are of particular 
priority for the NHS to focus on, particularly given the demands on the system that we're currently facing? We've coined the term proportionate universalism. And by that I mean the NHS is a universalist system. It's available to all of us. But some of us need it more than others. So we have effort proportionate to need. And the idea is we want a universalist system that's for everybody. Ideally, you probably like to die bungee jumping at 95, you know, and the rope snaps and that's it. <laughs> Never having used the NHS, that would be, you know, you, you wouldn't regret having paid taxes all those years. You'd, be pretty happy that you never needed it. But if you had diabetes and heart disease and glaucoma and eye problems, you'd like a lot of care and that's what the NHS is there for. So the whole idea of proportionate universalism, if you think about the social gradient, it means we're not picking out one group at particular risk. We're looking at the whole social spectrum but with effort proportionate to need. Poorer people, people with chronic illness, are going to need more effort and that's what we should be doing. But what we don't want is a health system for the poor and another system for everybody else. A health system for the poor is a poor health system. Okay, thank you. So moving on to the report that is uh, being published, what lessons do you feel we can learn from the vanguards? The first is that you've got to want to do it. In other words, we need a strategy set from the top and from each part of the health system. We want to improve the health of our local population. We want to use the resources of our healthcare system appropriately, as you said in your introduction, focus on prevention, focus on place, our local population. Now you might say, well, what can a health care system do about housing? Well, not a lot about improving the supply of housing, but for example, if people are choosing between eating and heating, they're going to get sick either because they're eating inadequately and or because they're living in cold homes. If we're working in the healthcare system, we need to be trying to address that. Now that'll mean working in partnership. So a key message is firstly, prevention. Secondly, focus on place. Thirdly, good data diagnosing the problem. And that means looking at social determinants and health equity. I'll come back to that in a moment. Fourth, working in partnership. So identifying, well, if I can't do something about improving fuel poverty, can I work with somebody who can do something about improving fuel poverty? I said I'd come back to the measurement. We've done some work with Tower Hamlets at trying to set up a measurement system that links data that the local authority collects with data that the health care system collects, try to merge them, anonymize them. Privacy is a big issue at the moment with Facebook and Google and Cambridge Analytica, anonymize them so in individuals can't be identified, but then you actually get a data system that identifies the problems of social determinants and inequalities in health. And good data is important for taking action. I mean, just take one issue, fear of crime. You think, what can the healthcare system, why should the healthcare system worry about fear of crime? Well, we know if older people are worried about crime, they're less likely to go out. Mm. Social isolation kills older people. And the health and social care system can actually do something about social isolation. I mean, there was a wonderful example with uh, some 
uh, an organization that I had a bit of um, business with in Italy, a charity. And every street corner, more or less, in Italy, there are the newsstands. This charity got together with um, the people who run these newsstands and they gave them a list of everyone in their little patch over 75 years of age. And they said when the temperature goes above whatever it was, 30 degrees centigrade or whatever, they please go and check on the older people in your patch. Just make sure they're okay. They've got enough water to drink. They don't need help in one way or another. So they're getting the paper sellers to help with dealing with the health, potential health issues of the older population in a very local way. Community assets in action. Absolutely. Fantastic. So thinking about the report that's coming out, what would you say are the key actions that it gives the systems now, the new systems that have been set up, what are the key things within the report that can really help them get to grips with reducing health inequalities? Well, we identify the importance of strategy, of saying, we can do this, let's work out how to do it. Secondly, there are a couple of existing mechanisms that can be used. Um, social value in commissioning by uh, making use of the Social Value Act, of looking at the potential social value of commissioning of all the services that NHS commission, is it having a positive impact on the health and well-being of our local population, for example? Secondly, social prescribing. There are primary care centres that put more emphasis in a way on social prescribing than they do on prescribing pharmaceuticals. In other words, dealing with the social care needs as well as the health care needs of the population. And then the kinds of things that I've been talking about of diagnosing the problem, having good data to diagnose the problem, working in partnership, focus on prevention, and the problems of place. And they're good examples now coming out of the health service of people doing that. And you mentioned the, the partnership and the opportunity we have with systems looking at that wider approach to the public sector services, so much broader than our usual approach to health and social care. What sort of opportunities do you think there are in terms of that total approach to the community workforce we have within a local system? We're in challenging times. If you think things are tough within the health care system, budgets to local authorities have been cut by up to 40%. The cuts are steeper in more deprived local authorities where the need is greater. The cuts have been more savage than in less deprived areas. So if somebody in the healthcare system goes along to the local authority and saying, are you ready for us? You know, we want to make use of all your wonderful services. They're saying, we've been cut to the bone. So it is challenging at the moment. It's a very challenging environment. But take the obvious one that everybody's been concerned about, social care for the elderly. Well, we now have a, a Secretary of State for Health and Care Precisely because we need to get those aligned. Um, helping older people to lead a meaningful, independent existence is highly relevant to the burden on the healthcare system. So we need to be working in partnership. Look at young children at the other end of life. If children are sick, they need to be treated. But promoting good social development, cognitive, linguistic, emotional, behavioural development is part of setting the platform right for better health and narrowing of health inequalities later in life. So we in the healthcare system need to be working in partnership with those concerned with early child development. So a real opportunity if we joined up all the different plans, the ways of working, 
we could potentially get a lot more out of the capacity we've got and at the same time improve outcomes and reduce health inequalities. There's something fundamental here that in a way doesn't come through the report we've done for NHS England, but it is fundamental that my view is that most people working in the health service, working in the fire service, I know the police less well, but working in social services, most people want to do a good job. And in these services, doing a good job doesn't just mean getting a nice tick in a box on a form, it means helping people. That's what most of us want to do who work in these services. We want to do a good job. And we're saying, let's define good job as improving the health of the local population and reducing health inequalities. And in a way, what we need to do is to create the opportunities for people to pursue that vocation, that mission of improving things for people. Thank you very much, Sir Michael. So one last question. Do you feel like the message is starting to get out there about this, about the importance of it, about it being everybody's business? You have to discount what I say because I'm an optimist and I see good things happening everywhere. But we produced a report, when I was president of the BME, we produced a report on what the health care professions could do to address social determinants of health. We got sign up from 19 medical royal colleges and, and royal college of nursing and the like. And I, in a very self-indulgent way, went through my diary for the last few months at who has invited me to come and talk to them about social determinants and health equity. Surgeons, physicians, cardiologists, specialists in thoracic medicine, psychiatrists, pediatricians, geriatricians, obstetricians, people concerned with inclusion health, people concerned with early child development, crime, civil unrest, community development, urban planning. I even had a group of classicists from Edinburgh University who are concerned with honour in the ancient world invited me to come and give a public lecture. Why? Well, because they think I'm talking about people having autonomy, agency, control over their lives as being vital to their health. And they think those concepts are relevant to the concepts of honour in the ancient world. And then, of course, primary care and public health and health care administrators have all been interested. Now, I'm not totally naive about this. The fact that people are interested doesn't mean that things are going to happen straight away. But if they weren't interested, you can guarantee nothing would happen. So when I see that Coventry is a marmot city, I get excited. <laughs> That means the chief executive of local government has said, we want to take the Marmot recommendations and apply them to the city as a whole, which of course includes the healthcare system, but much more. Thank you so much, Sir Michael. That was incredibly interesting and a great introduction to the report that'll have so much detail in it of interest to systems in how they can take action on reducing health inequalities.